Good evening and welcome everyone to a very special event co-hosted by the SOAS Japan Research Center and the SOAS Library in which we'll discuss Miyazaki Hayao's latest film, The Boy and the Heron, or in Japanese, Kimitachi wa doi kiruka. My name is Charles Tenonji Abstel. I've worked here at SOAS for the last six years as Executive Officer in the Centers and Institutes Office. And more recently, I've begun working as the Events and Outreach Manager in the Library. As a former BA Japanese student here at SOAS, it gives me great pleasure to host this event and introduce our panelists, Dr. Fabio Gigi, Dr. Satna Suzuki, and Dr. Filippo Cervelli. Dr. Fabio Gigi is chair of the Japan Research Center and senior lecturer in anthropology. His research covers the intersection of material culture and medical anthropology with a focus on how medical and social categories are formed around practices of disposal. He is the co-editor of The Work of Gender, Service, Performance, and Fantasy in Contemporary Japan, and has written about animism, dolls, robots, and Marie Kondo. Dr. Satana Suzuki is currently a lecture, lecturer in Japanese and modern Japanese history here at SOAS. Trained as a historian in the Department of History at SOAS, her main interests are the rise of modern Japan with an emphasis on imperialism, militarism, ideology, and the relationship between politics and religion. She also teaches advanced Japanese using current issues in Japan, including constitutional revision, security, and gender. Dr. Filippo Cervelli received his PhD in Oriental Studies at the University of Oxford and is currently lecturer in modern Japanese literature and popular culture at SOAS. He has written on the literature of Takahashi Genichiro, Oe Kenzaburo, Abe Kazushige on post-Fukushima fiction and on manga and animation. He recently co-edited an interdisciplinary special issue on rep representations of nerds and loneliness. Now, before we begin, we'd like to start by watching a video to get us all in the mood to discuss the film. Uh, afterwards, we'll have a panel discussion and there'll be plenty of time for uh, questions and answers at the end. So please save your questions for then. Uh, but before we begin, please be aware that the discussion today will contain heavy spoilers. So if you haven't seen the film, remain at your peril. Is everyone in the mood? All right, let me start by asking the panel, uh, what did you think of the film? What were some of the things you liked and some of the things you disliked? And how does it compare to Miyazaki's other films? And what did you make of the themes of grief, the afterlife and coming of age? Um, Fabio, shall we start with you? <laughs> Thank you very much. So for me, it was like um, it was like meeting an old friend that you hadn't seen for about 10 years. That's the distance between the last film, Kazeta Jinu. And you meet them, and there's there's lots of familiar things. There's familiar characters. There's the way that flight is so important in the world portrayed. There's the obasantachi, the the old uh, women who sort of scurry around that are depicted in a sort of very familiar way. Um, they are the mysterious, cute creatures um, that abound and that uh, play sort of uh, a quite a secretive function in the film. But then, as you start to talk with that friend that you hadn't seen for a long time, you realize, oh, actually quite a lot of things have happened in those 10 years and it's not so similar. And you start realizing there's quite, there's a lot of different things that are happening uh, that sort of try to stretch both what the medium can do, especially that first scene in the fire that sort of feels very different um, for the normal single cell animation. Um, and the whole structure of the film, this idea that there is a hidden world that already exists uh, in Spirited Away, um, but that you can see as is given a very different kind of function. So there is the real world, as also depicted in the last film, the, the wind rises, that is completely set in the real world where there's no fantastic element. And so there's a return to this idea that, yes, yeah, so there is the real world, uh, a world, a world of war, of militarism, um, but there is this other hidden world and what that does uh, psychologically or what its function is, we can talk about, I think, today. What about you, Satana? Oh, you okay. So I didn't know anything about it. Well, I mean, I avoided to know anything about it. I mean, so it was quite good that the director uh, didn't really publish anything beforehand. Um but even after that, I avoided it because I just wanted to see it for myself and sort of decide. And so I was actually mostly interested in the music because I love Ghibli music. I always listen to it when I, while I'm marking, for example, <laughs> to kind of, you know, relax myself and things. Um, but yeah, besides music, I really um, enjoyed it in general, um, especially because I didn't expect anything. But then... 
I saw a lot of kind of references with, I thought Disney, you know, like and Alice in Wonderland and also Snow White with seven grammars and things like that. And also it was set in 1940s, but I felt sort of nostalgic, even though I wasn't born in 1940s. It made me feel like, oh, my God, like old Japan, Showa period. So that sort of sense of nostalgia really hit me. And also, um, what else? Uh, subtitles, because I saw it here. Mm-hmm. And obviously, we couldn't avoid subtitles. So I was um, analyzing the translation. Mm-hmm. I, I couldn't help myself. So it was a <laughs> bit sort of distract- destructive in a way. But yeah, I was thinking, why did they translate it like that? And I mm-hmm. had to think for like maybe five minutes and say, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So a little bit of distraction there. But yeah, I pretty much enjoyed it. And also, what else? Yeah, like Fabio said, like uh, mystical, magical creatures, um, parallel world. And also, I felt, um, I don't want to spoil too much, but reincarnation, mm-hmm. war, um, mother, motherhood, that sort of thing. So yeah, I really enjoyed it. Yeah. But I think I have to watch it more <laughs> at least two more times uh, to actually get to. it yeah yeah Beautiful. yeah thank you yeah on, on that note of rewatching it i think yeah my experience uh speaks to that because i saw the film when it first came out in japan uh in july so at the time we didn't the world didn't know ex- absolutely anything about what it was like uh, like if the japanese title is even more cryptic than the international one. Kimitachi wa doi kiruka is how do you live? How do you something like that? So, and for me, even the the image of what we then know is a heron in the in the in the only posters that were circulated in Japan. I didn't even know what that was, so I didn't know what it was about. And also, uh, as Fabio said, coming from the last movie directed by Miyazaki before then, Kaze Tachinu, which is really set in the real world. I, I, I didn't, I wasn't expecting something, something that deals a lot with fantasy like that. So it, I was surprised the first time I saw the movie, I was also, I felt lost. Maybe also because it was a night, I had just had a very heavy fried Neapolitan pizza at Sorbillo and Hombashi, so maybe that didn't help my concentration. But I felt that somehow Miyazaki had crammed a lot of themes there, right? That many that we can see in other movies directed by him, but also some something else. So then to prepare also for today, I saw it again in London um, with, a, with a clearer mind and I found more literary references that I had missed the first time around, which uh, gave me some other layers of interpretation. Um, this relationship with uh, with the fantasy world, as we will also see later on, uh, I found it to be very literary, which I found it very interesting. And uh, I think now that it's a film that gives uh, stimulates a lot. There are many things to read in. There are important things that it does uniquely, but also things that emerge if you if you watch it in. Um, correspondence with other films by by Miyazaki. So, uh, despite you know certain uh, things that I think the movie does better, things that I don't think it does as well as in other movies, but uh, there is definitely a lot to unpack, and I found it a lot more interesting the second time around. <laughs> Satana Filippo, you you touched on the well, Satana, you mentioned the translation, and Filippo, you talked about the the title and the significance of it. So obviously in English, it's the boy and the heron. In Japanese, it, it translates to how do you live? Um, could you tell us about why they might have chosen to translate it this way? And, and sort of what effect does that have on the, the viewer's experience? Philippa? Um, yeah. Y- yeah, I mean, it was not actually based on, well, loosely based on the uh, original uh, mm-hmm. Yoshino Genzaburo's Kimi wa Dori Kiruka, How Do You Live? So uh, the original novel, uh, the translation is how, how do you live, right? Yeah, but because he was inspired by it and he used the novel in the movie, which kind of like awakens the Mahito. So he, from from that purpose, he didn't have to translate it as, how do you live? 
So for Western audience purposes, the purpose for the Western audience, it was easier to say boy and heron because it was about the friendship between the two as well. So, yeah, maybe, I don't know, for the Western audience, they wanted to emphasize on the friendship. That's my interpretation. Mm -hmm. No, yes, I, I definitely agree with that. And I mean, as 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 um, Satuna said, the, the the book is was written in 1937. It was translated in English in 2021, uh, and it, it's a very different story from from the one that we see in the in the film. And even the the name of the protagonist of the boy is different. In one in the book is Honda Junichi that everybody calls Koppel or Koperu in Japanese, which makes more sense because. It is from um, Copernicus, the astronomer. So it is a very loose adaptation. So I I think that in the English, of course, they wanted to focus on the heron element, also probably because marketing-wise is the first thing that we see, right? Like this this bird. In in Japanese, the Kimitachi Adoi Kiruka, it makes sense if we see the movie, of course, also if we think about the book, because the book is basically a coming of age story uh, between um, a junior high schooler that that discovers the world, discovers relationships in the world that are very simple because it could be um, something gleaned from a, a fight at school, something uh, understood through seeing his schoolmate make tofu, and then discussing about this with his uncle. So the, the uncle is an important figure in both the movie and, and the book. But in uh, to put it briefly in the book, it is through this musings of the child that understands the different underworkings, the relations in the world, what it means to respect others. This is also posing a question of, of how, how do you live? That is why that makes sense. Like thinking about all of these micro things in the world, that the world is made of relations of people that help each other, people that produce, that gather the beans, that people that buy them, people that make them into tofu, people that buy the tofu, people that are happy because of the tofu. Like it's right, understanding that the world is made of people working together in these different relations of productions. Then the book asks this question, like now that you know all of this, how do you think you want to behave yourself from now on? And um, um, I think if we, we also have to think that the author of the book, uh, Yoshino Genzaburo, he he was an, an educator. So he he was trained in philosophy. He worked for a publisher. He was a person that, although coming from a, a good background, like a well-off background in in those years in Japan, uh, he was uh, also participating in uh, socialist meetings and, and uh, thinking what, what would be better for society, for the workers. And he was also detained uh, because of these subversive uh, associations. After being held in prison for 18 months, he was then released. And then he continued his uh, educational activity by becoming a serious editor in ethical books. And his editor... Uh, chief publisher told him, like, why don't you put all of these lessons that you have in a book format? And and then he he published this, which is uh, like a kind of a compendium of of his thought, right? So in this sense, we can see it. How 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 do you live? And I think that it is this spirit of um, of thinking of our experience and how it connects with the world that Miyazaki transposed the title of the book to his movie, right? So we mentioned earlier that the, the well, the film obviously takes place during the Pacific War and the historical backdrop is referenced uh, many times throughout the film. Um, could you, the panel, maybe tell us a little bit about why they might have chosen to use this point in history as the setting? Uh, Fabio, would you like to, or, or I Sathana? I that's, well, you haven't said anything. Haven't so said anything. Like, <laughs> if you're going to say something fast, then I will add mm. something. Yeah. Well, there is there is an, uh, an interesting sense in which, I just wanted to say quickly that the, the, the name of the protagonist, Mahito, a sincere human or true human is quite interesting mm. from Copernicus, so to speak, yes. to mm. the true being. And it's very different if you compare it to the other 
um, boy figures in his films that are usually innocent, sort of plucky boy hero stereotypes. Mahito is quite different. He 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 knows about um, his own difficulties. He knows about his own badness, as he says at the very um, end. Uh, and so it's it's very interesting to compare that with the the often female figures that you have, like Shita, for example, in uh, Castle in the Sky, um, or even Kiki uh, in Majo no Takubin, uh, the Little Witch. So the female characters often ha have this kind of knowing about something that is very and, and and the boys they don't they they have to sort of find it and, and figure out what it is um what it is supposed to be about um and that gives an interesting dynamic but here in the last film there is a similar kind of knowing uh, that is presented um at the outset that the true mensch um sort of has so we're not lo no longer talking about just uh, sort of an idealized figure uh, but there's something else going on. And the setting is, of course, historical setting is interesting because it also refers to uh, Miyazaki's own experience. Mm. Many events in the film are parallel to events in his own life. He lost uh, his mother quite early on, uh, not like in the film, uh, due to um, a, an attack, but uh, due to spinal tuberculosis. Yeah. Um, yes. To... She didn't die like that early mm. but she, she wasn't around when he was growing yes. up so he missed her and yeah so i think she lived for a quite a long time a few yes a few, a few more years, few years than years. Yes. <laughs> yes. yeah 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 but yeah she, she uh, absent yeah, she, yeah absent yeah absent mother so she you can sort of see that he's longing for having mother as a young you know, right. boy or young child, as it were. And in that sense, it is a narrative yeah. of loss. And the, the fantasy world only comes in once the loss has happened. So it's it's almost, you could say, in modern parlance, a kind of trauma reaction that you create this parallel fantasy world that you can retreat to, where all the real elements of the world are still there. So the militarism is still there in the form of the of the parrots, who are sort of a militarized uh, species in the mm. parallel world. Um, of the film, there's still this idea to be called upon as a successor by sort of a shadowy uh, father figure. Um, and each person that exists in the real world has sort of a double, like a doppelganger in the second um, world. And they interact in very interesting ways. So it was set in the 1944, if I'm correct, because he says something like, my mother died three years after the war started. So mm. that must have been 1944, right? So that's like, so when you see the fire at the beginning and he says, my mother died in the fire, but I kind of thought that maybe it was the uh, air raid by the United States. It could have been the the bombing. So it was like, and then after that, he was evacuated to the countryside. So that actually happened as well at the time. But the... um. The thing I thought was that it was normally like not so well of people, only kids were evacuated, not with you know their their family. Certainly not at this really fancy, well, it's not a palace, but it's really fancy house. So mm. it's like uh war from a bourgeois perspective, <laughs> you know, because they had yeah. they had food, you know, they also lived in a sort of Western style mansion, right? And that was supposed to be um, uh, considered not so good because, you know, you don't live in a Western style house, you know, because they're like the enemies. So um, that's like a parallel to his own life because he's actually, his um, own father uh, owned the uh, fighter aircraft industries. So they're really well off. And I think um, Miyazaki was a little bit kind of ashamed of that because he was well off <laughs> <laughs> even during the war. So yeah, he he often talked about it in the interviews, I think afterwards. And also his real father, he um, his mother was actually his, mother, his father's second wife. Mm. Um, so his first wife died and then remarried Miyazaki's father a year later so there's a that sort of similarity as well so yeah that's why I think it's um, um kind of like semi-autobiography mm. as well 
yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, and also something else I noticed, maybe because I'm I'm a historian, but uh, uh, the How Do You Live when it was written was Showa 12. So that 1937. Yeah. Yes. So that was when the second Sino, well, a sec second Sino Japanese war took place. Mm. So that was uh, a little bit interesting for me because uh, the themes of wars and things are there, mm. but still not like um, really desperate um, stories like uh, Fireflies of the Grave. Mm. You know, that was really sad about, you know, really, really mm. poor families' perspective. So, yeah, I thought that was pretty pretty interesting yes if i could just add to that about the book and the historical context so um the there's one part of the book where one of the experiences that copper makes is against a, a band of bullies at school so they start to there's an episode where he and his friends uh, realize that the the older classmates in the higher classes they are becoming bullies because they think basically that uh, the the boys especially in the school are becoming effeminate it doesn't this is not a word that comes here but basically they say they don't sing the anthem of the school they're not concentrated on in sports and masculine things they don't properly bow to their elders and they they like literature or <laughs> they, they watch plays they go to the theater so they i think that it is very hard not to think of a parallel with a, a, a surge in imperialism in Japan at the time. Of course, there is nothing that is overtly about that in the book, because also in 1937, it probably would not have passed censorship. But it is it is it is impossible not to not to see that the way in the in which these uh, bullies that that pick on on the, um, the smaller, more gentle kids has something of um an aggressive stance that that we can also read in 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 the bigger context of a preoccupation with with growing militarism and aggressiveness over Japan that somehow like had to uh, stress uh, the group culture like we are not the the artistic individuality but right more of a let's gang up let's let's be let's be uh, physically strong so it's something that comes up in the book and I don't know might also have tickled Miyazaki's imagination. Let's talk a little bit about the the animation in the film because uh, there are a few really striking scenes that that stand out even by Miyazaki's standards. Um, what what did the panel think about this and and also how do you think the the film is going to sort of stand up against um, other big animations during award season? Fabio, would you like to begin? Okay, I can go first. Thank you. Um, so I already mentioned the first, the fire scene that was just looked very different um, from both Miyazaki style and also other styles of animation. We know that it took so long to make the film because it uses an enormous amount of individual images for each second. Um, so it's a very high image to time ratio. Uh, and it's all handcrafted. So this is an artisanal uh, product, uh, quite different from other animation studios who often use CGI methods um, and also uh, now increasingly artificial intelligence. And uh, Miyazaki Hayao has spoken out against that and has taken a very clear stance and said it's essentially uh, inhuman to do so. But there's something else as well. So at the very beginning, when we encounter, so the double mother, so his mother passes away, there is the sister that looks very similar and that sort of welcomes him and they step into the rickshaw. And this is strange, so that for a moment, you sort of, you, we, I sat in the cinema and I thought, uh, you know, it's, you're always moving your own body with that happening. It's as if the image creates a really embodied sense of this very simple action of stepping up. And this, I thought, oh, wow, something else is happening. So this is not just an image that you look at from afar, two-dimensional. Uh, this is something that does something to your perception. And I thought, how is this going to be used later on? But it doesn't recur, at least in my experience, it didn't recur later on. It was as if it was sort of an, a quick nod saying, here, I can do this to you. So it's a very powerful style of animation that I thought 
shows that Miyazaki continued to experiment uh, with new ways of drawing the audiences in, with new ways of depicting uh, scenes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I it may be, it may sound really strange, but I don't really look at it as anime. <laughs> I look at it as a film. A film. Yeah, so um, from that perspective, yes, I mean, those kind of, jarring feeling mm. I, I I felt that too actually and also the fire and also I felt like um there's a distinctive difference between when he was in the real world and when he was in the and the world as it were so in the real world everything was kind of slow mm. like you know putting on trousers and things whereas everything was really fast in the underworld uh -huh. so I thought that was quite interesting because um I would have thought that real world would have been quicker, maybe nowadays, but yeah. Mm. Sorry, I didn't answer the question, but that's what's No, but thinking. definitely um, thinking also about the opening sequences, what, what's one thing that has struck me both times when I saw the film is the way Mahito like climbs the stairs, like when they, when at the very beginning they are- That was they, fast. Eh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, they say, hey, Mahito, and and so he he climbs the stairs to the upper floor, and it feels like a frog in a way, like or, or like an animal that is quickly climbing. So I think that in a way destabilizes our perception a little bit, right? Because we start the air raid, uh, the, the the bombing, the the fire. So it is a very strong, it is very clearly historically located in a way, right? But then we have this uh, these movements, and then also when he's trying to to reach the the site where his mother is, that like the way she is represented with the flames, like the, I think we saw that in the video as well, uh, that they blur the the contours in a way, but in with a different technology. I, so I I'm 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 wondering whether yeah, as you say, Fabio, is it, it's him saying, oh, I yeah, I can do this, especially. Because if you look at some of the other candidates for the awards, like one is Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, so, which is a very completely different kind of animation, which destabilizes me uh, in a way. <laughs> but it's it's more technical. Like it, it feels in a way that Miyazaki's way and his team's way of animation is like they're trying to make a last stand mm -hmm. for, for a hand-drawn animation in a way and trying to complicate the things like as though what even though they are animating but it's like somebody's there with with a hand camera right yeah, it's like you're experiencing it as yeah. well yes. yeah you're not just looking so at it yeah know. it's it, mm. so sometimes it's uncomfortable mm. sometimes it's yeah. jarring yeah and and then it also very clearly contrasts especially with the fantasy world where we have creatures that have a very simple design mm. some creatures of the forest some spirits some have a very very simple design right like even the parrots i think that the the ease of flying this is always something that mm. struck me from the very beginning from you know uh from Naushka of the valley of winds onward the idea that when you fly it's a completely smooth movement it sort of gives you overview over the world it's 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 something completely done with ease mm. very much in contrast to the sort of the yes, yes, yes. And it's it's cumbersome like it's yeah. murky right when he climbs the stairs like and even when the frogs climb on him, right? Like yeah, the... that reminded me of uh, Stephen King's novel. Uh, um, the what is it? The the frogs rain on you. The sword, no. Yeah, no. I can't remember I the name. But it's anyway, written yeah. so many. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> loads of re mm. references. Mm. Uh. So Miyazaki has obviously uh, famously retired many times, <laughs> and <laughs> <laughs> claiming that he's not going to make any more films, but. Will this film actually be his last, in your opinion? Is it a fitting legacy to, to well, fitting end to his legacy? And, and is it really his last stand for, you know, Japanese animation as, as he's sort of invented it to be? I don't think so. Because mm. I apparently he's already talked to, you know, his friend slash producer, Suzuki Toshio, mm -hmm. that he already sort of started talking about new ideas. And so Suzuki producer, he actually talk to the French uh, journalists that we can't stop him. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to let him do whatever he wants. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, if that's true, then no. Mm -hmm. yeah. But then it, it feels like 
uh, he didn't manage to create like uh, um, his um, somebody who inherits him. Like mm. uh, what's the word? So I can't remember. Successor. Successor. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So he didn't manage to create successor. So maybe I don't know. Maybe he's still trying to do whatever he can until he dies. Um, yeah. So I don't think it's going to be his last. I, I I agree. I, I was in Japan when the last one came out, Kaze, Kaze Tachinu, mm. and it, there was a similar discourse around that, saying, oh, maybe this is probably the last. And often the connection was made between this being a story set in reality, so no fantasy element, saying, okay, this must be the legacy. Looking back at the history, sort of showing this is what happened. And there was quite a lot of interesting political reactions across Asia, because if you remember, there was there was sort of there was a German character there, but then the German character wasn't was sort of an anti-Nazi. And 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 yes, the, the Jido was working mm. to create a, a fighting plane. Um, but sort of there was also an anti-war message in the film. So there were there were interesting contradictions there. Many people said this must be a legacy work. Um and now, 10 years later. Uh, I also I don't think uh, mm. you can stop uh, somebody who has such a, a creative drive, yeah. a creative talent. Um, yeah, there will be more, mm. hopefully. Yeah, yeah. Um, even my perception is is very much the same. Also, because I think that uh, the way Miyazaki has worked, the way what he represents, this this Showa mm. work person, right, uh, will will not probably give so a peace to his soul until he has given uh, everything and also I'm, I'm i'm wondering like what does he do at home like where he's not doing anything I'm, i don't i'm not i don't know if his wife wants him around when he's <laughs> talking to him so yeah yeah <laughs> and uh and then of course i mean he's such an an important character that also we have testimonies that he's not the easiest person to work with <laughs> so to put it like that so even with the relationship with his son that wanted to follow in the footsteps uh, and then absolutely not and i mean i have heard some theories saying that some scenes in in the boy and the heron i will not say which ones <laughs> are a kind of uh symbolizing that he's passing the baton to his son but i didn't i don't really see that I don't know. I mean, it's an interesting theory if you have seen the movie. And then I'm, I'm... It's the uncle trying to pass the button to exactly. Mahito, but Mahito said no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but is it really like the son saying no, or is it actually the young Miyazaki said, no, no, yeah, I don't get your baton, but I'm not even passing mine <laughs> yeah, or something. Exactly. So the, the uncle and Mahito are both him, mm. old and new. Mm. Uh, no, old and young. Yeah. Yeah. Even so then. yeah, I definitely concur that I don't think this is the last we have seen. And in a way, uh, this this debate around Miyazaki reminds me a little bit of uh, what people said also of uh, the writer uh, Oe Kenzaburo, because who passed away last year. Also, in his case, like I think for twenty years, it was like this is my last novel. Mm -hmm. And if you read the novels, it, it's like this old man that preparing for his death in these semi-autobiographical novels when even when he was 60 and he never he didn't stop until very recently and he he even wrote a novel years ago which which is called Sayonara Watashi no Honyo so it's like farewell to all my books and then there was in late style like a response to Said and many other things so but I think that we need these people <laughs> to to Entertainer. to work, yes, and make us think um, as much as much as they can. Yes. You mentioned it earlier on about the the peculiar marketing strategy in Japan to to not advertise the film at all. Now, obviously, that wasn't the case here in the West. But um, what what do you think of that? And could could you elaborate a little bit on, on why you think they might have done that? And is it just a luxury that a studio as prestigious as Studio Ghibli can? can do yeah i mean a bit of that and also it's a new sort of way of advertising mm -hmm. isn't it not to advertise mm -hmm. so that kind of catches the uh people's attention but i i read it somewhere that uh some people are really put off by the title how do you live because uh, it's a bit preachy mm -hmm. so uh, the japanese <laughs> audience uh, like, not gonna watch this uh, but yeah so the boy and heron are more sort of easier approachable as it were 
but yeah I mean as I said I think this is a film that you want to watch again and again mm. it's like the more you watch it the more you understand it or you discover different perspectives mm. so yeah I think there's also there's a sense of enigmatic you know advertisement it works really well because he's such an established name uh, it's been 10 years since the last film, roughly. Before that, the, I think uh, Ponyo came out in 2008, so it's a five year. So this is quite a long uh, time to wait. Yeah. And so anticipa anticipation was building. And uh, you don't really, you know, I talked to many of my friends in Japan and they all said, well, it's a Miyazaki film. Obviously, we're going to see it. It doesn't matter really what it is. It is a Miyazaki film. So in a sense, it is an advertisement in and of itself. Yeah. But it works well with me because I don't want to know anything about it. Yes. <laughs> it definitely worked well. And um, even gauging some reactions across the web when the movie came out in Japan, I also read some things that were interpreting this, again, as a form of Japanese-ness in a way, like to show without showing or like to be... To be failed by the nothingness, you know. I've even, very I've, zen. I've even, yeah, very zen, of course. Uh, I mean, I would think that in the current panorama of animation, probably him and Shinkai can afford that, mm. because I'm sure that if the next Shinkai movie we don't know anything about it, people will go anyway. Yeah. Uh, but it definitely, of course, you you cannot be a, a young new filmmaker and do this because. It will not work, <laughs> but it was incredibly successful in, in this case, right? Also because I think it's a movie that probably the first time you see it and you get out of the cinema and people ask you what it is about, you say, I don't know, really? <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. I think it, as a feedback, it also it works is. very well. <laughs> mm. I just wanted to mention um, the, uh, what's his name? The Yone Zukenshi, the, yes. the, the singer. Uh, when he presented the song, so he was asked to create the song, and when he presented to um, the, the the Miyazaki, he apparently cried, mm. and so he was at the Yonezu was really moved, and he said it would be like my treasure for the rest of my life mm. <laughs> because he just really respected Miyazaki so much. So yeah, I mean, I really liked the song. I thought that was mm. really beautiful. And my geeky note, uh, Yonezu is also the composer of the music to Final Fantasy XVI. <laughs> <laughs> he's very popular. Yeah, he's very popular. Yeah. So there's one more question I have for the panel to open up for a QA, and a and that is about the, the references in the film. So we mentioned earlier on that there were a few references to other literary pieces and films. You mentioned Snow White. Um, could, could you speak to this a little bit more? What, what other references did you observe? Uh, Philippa, would you like to? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Charles. Uh, so one that I was very happy to find that is very dear to me is are the references to Dante Alighieri's Divine Comedy. Uh, so uh, I know I'm talking more and more about Dante recently, but um, when when Mahito enters the first step into this fantasy world, he has to go into a tower, and we briefly have a glimpse of the entrance of the tower, which is was also shown in the in the trailer. And I, Charles can can pull it up. So uh, it is not ama amazingly visible here, but not even in the movie. But on the arch, there is a sentence in in medieval Florentine, uh, which is "Fece mi la divina potestate," which is a line from the Divine Comedy. It is in the third canto of the Inferno when, when Dante is entering the gates of hell, and this is the inscription on the door. And the, the third set that precedes this is the most famous one because, because it is the permessi va nella città dolente, permessi va nell'eterno dolore, permessi va tra la perduta gente. Through me the way into the suffering city, through me the way to the eternal pain, through me the way that runs among the lost, which is something that uh, Italian high schoolers used to put on the door to their classrooms when <laughs> teachers come in. <laughs> <laughs> then this sentence, fece mi la divina potestate, la somma sapienza, il primo amore, it means my maker was divine authority. This is what it means. The highest wisdom and the primal love. So it is a reference to God. And I think this is interesting because 
it is not the most obvious reference because it is an Italian, but this is Dante 13th, 13th century Italian. So even if you're fluent in Italian, it's not the easiest thing ever. But it, it made me think about the references and the similarities because, of course, both in Dante and here, we are think we're seeing a gate, like we're going through a gate that leads us to the underworld, a fantasy world in the movie Miyazaki. So, and there are countless references to this, like the fact that there is a, an uncle godlike figure that speaks to Mahito from above against a, a starry sky, which can make us think about paradise, the, the starry sky in Dante's voyage to the paradise. The fact that he asks the heron to, to lead and guide Mahito which can we, we can see as a Virgil-like figure that guides Dante, although the heron is much clumsier than, than, uh, than Virgil. Um, and also then there are river scenes, river scenes with, with fairy people. One is Kiriko, the, the, the fisher, the fisher woman, right? Uh, and also we have scenes that make us think about the river Styx in, um, in, in uh, the river Acheron, sorry, in um, in the Divine Comedy, where where the Charon, the ferryman, uh, ferries the the souls of the the dead into the underworld, and even then, in the Divine Comedy, Charon is surprised to see a living soul, Dante, and even here, Machito, Machito right, is singled out, and we have many scenes of boats with spirits on them, which made me think a lot of these references, but. Of course, these are not just mere homages with Miyazaki showing that, oh yeah, I know about this. Uh, but it is it made me think about what what this underworld means, right? The 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 voyage that Mahito Enterprise uh, uh, is on is a is a voyage into, in a way like Dante, into the understanding better who he is, right? Like Dante talks to a lot of dead people in the inferno, in the purgatory. And also in the paradise, through their experiences, he learns also about himself, salvation. In a way, I think we can also see glimpses of that in the in Miyazaki's movie, because Mahito is exposed to a lot of crazy different characters in this underworld, which in this world, in this fantasy world, that make him think uh, about his own self and also like how he wants to live. Like we can also see this the other way around that in the way the divine comedy is a, is a reflection on like how do you live like after having met all of these people mid in halfway through your life how how do you live and i think that uh it is showing once more that when these authors in japan they tackle the ideas of knowing yourself through the voyage through seeing even getting in touch with with people that are dead uh the imagery of dante are is very strong in in some of these authors not all of them but some of them <laughs> anything I, I just noticed snow white seven books <laughs> seven grammars yeah and also uh but it, it, interestingly kiriko was one of them but she was not you know she was special right so um i wonder why that was but yeah seven Dwarfs and also I thought the the heron was the uh, the rabbit mm. um, of the uh, Alice, Alice in the Wonderland, definitely. Yeah, um, but it was kind of half heron, half human, so <laughs> it became scary to kind of comical and then enemy to his friends. Mm. So some people say that that was his uh, friend, the Suzuki producer. Mm. Uh, yeah, the heroine. Yeah, the heroine. Oh, okay. Because, you know, um, apparently uh, they would sort of like argue like lovers on the set. So, you know, like really affectionate kind of fights. Do you see what I mean? So, um, yeah, people thought that, yeah, it was uh, the embodiment of the producer. I thought that was quite good. I think, yeah, it's a trickster figure that can make you do things that you may not want to do. So I think that <laughs> yeah. it's a very interesting relationship between director yeah, um, and producer. producer. 
I, I thought there was, I mean, visually, there's a lot of visual reference, references, obviously. Um, there's lots of European architecture, especially in the underworld. Yeah. There's a library. There's also, there's uh, if you're familiar with Arnold Böcklin's Island of the Dead, that tomb that they come across is literally exactly that. So it's a very interesting sort of visual reference. And Miyazaki has often said in interviews that he doesn't start with the story. He starts with an image, like Tonarino Totoro is the standing Totoro standing at the bus stop um, next to the other characters. Mm -hmm. That was the starting point. So there was no story necessarily there to begin with. So you start from an image and you develop the image and you start thinking about what kind of story could be happening in this context. And so it's a very different way of building a narrative. And the other thing that came to my mind immediately when I was watching it was uh, uh, the similarity to Guillermo del Toro's uh, Pan's Labyrinth, also set in fascist Spain during the Second World War. Also, the, the, the main character uh, is a girl who escapes from the threat of um, being arrested by the fascist police that, that her family faces. Um, by escaping into a fantasy world. But the danger, of course, is also in the fantasy world. And the, the creature design, it's not an animated feature, um, but the creature design is also very scary and very mm. sort of horror-like and yet somehow poetic. So the idea that there's another world that is uh, sort of a, an inverse mirror image of the real world um, where similar things are happening, but where you can encounter all these dangerous things um, in a more symbolic way that then helps you knowing more about yourself and the other and how to overcome these difficulties. I thought that was uh, quite a, a, a powerful image. All right, I'd like to open the uh, the panel up to the floor for questions. Um, I know we've got a couple online, but should we take one in the room first? Yeah, over there, please. Thank you so much for the discussion. I just wanted to ask a question related to Pan's Labyrinth. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking about this all the time. Mm -hmm. The first time I watched it, right. I thought that it was very similar. And it's very interesting also what Felipe mentioned about Oe Genzaburo's kind of like interest in the rising of fascism in a way in his book and imperialism. And to me as well, in a similar way to how the Doro makes um, a kind of like fantasy out of Franco's dictatorship in Pan's Labyrinth. I also felt maybe that Miyazaki was kind of trying to capture the fall of the Japanese empire somehow through this kind of very carnivore parakeet yes. kingdom. And I was wondering how do you feel about that? Uh, I think he, sorry, mm -hmm. he felt the sense of guilt and he had this mm -hmm. conflicted feelings because uh, his father mm -hmm. was making money out of yeah. the uh, militarism or Japanese empire. Uh, so he actually was against the war, but he knew that he benefited from that when he was young. So, um, yeah, I think he uh, that was kind of packed in there, right. but not in the way that um, would criticize it, but right. more depicting it as it was from a perspective of wealthy family during the war. But it's also, it's also a displacement, right? So the the father in the film ap appears as a very kindly figure mm. yeah. to him. He's very nice and yasashi in general. Um, mm. But we only and we only get the connection to the aeroplane fabrication when they bring in the parts. Uh, so there's one scene where you suddenly realize, oh, there's something else going on as well. And so that's why in the underworld you have you sort of have a reflection of mm. that the parakeets. And this mysterious uncle figure that is also a kind of father figure that mm. tries to enjoin his son, enjoining him and becoming his successor, an inheritance that he uh, refuses in the end. So I think that it's one way of dealing with that without actually pointing mm. towards it, sort of, yeah. Mm. But uh, definitely there, mm. yeah. But I think his father was like his real father. Oh, sorry, his father, as in Mahito's father, was like a sort of spitting image of um, uh, Miyazaki's dad, because he also, you know, uh, was um, what? No, he co-owned the industry, the the the, the, the air, uh, fire air, aircraft um, industry. So um, yeah, and he was apparently very sort of um, hedonistic and <laughs> kind of kind of crazy, you know, person. 
so yeah he i think he's uh he liked his father i think that's why he portrayed him like that in the film pretty much like new money hedonistic and also a little bit crazy mm. and also caring mm. i guess yeah mm. Yeah, um, I think that if we if we also see this in relation to a broader context of other Miyazaki's movie, if movies, even uh, The Wind Rises, right? This relationship with, you know, somebody that is a good man, fundamentally, Horiko Shijiro, but he's also producing mm -hmm. Machines of Death. It is something, of course, that is very important in Miyazaki's works, Porco Rosso and others. I mean, the fascination between Mm, like mechanical things, uh, designs, but also the potential death that they bring is also, it's never black or white, right? It's never manichaeistic in this sense. It's never, oh, my father built like the father, right? I think in, in The Boy and the Heron, the figure of the father embodies this very well because he's embroiled in this industry, but he's not a, a, ter a, a bad man, mm -hmm. right? It's not like, um, like assimilated in the things that he makes, right? He makes warplanes or machines and then he's a bad person. And I mean, this fascination with, with machines is also something that we see in other anime directors who didn't leave World War II, like Anno Hideaki, for example, right? Yeah, who not, not by chance is also the, the voice of Horiko Shijiro in the Japanese version of The Wind Rises, so. I think the two have a lot in common. <laughs> Let's take a question from online. So anonymous attendee says, how do you think the presentation of grief and family connection compares between this movie and when Marnie was there? Which one is the second one? When Marnie was there? I haven't seen it. But Which one is the, Jap what is the Japanese title to that one? Does anybody know? Ah, no, I haven't seen that one. I haven't seen it. I haven't seen that. Yet. <laughs> Sorry, I can't do it. All right, no but problem. I felt the grief, mm. uh, his grief, um, all the way through until he read "How Do You Live" mm. um, in his bedroom and cried, mm. and I, I kind of felt it. Um, he didn't say anything, and he was really quiet, and he didn't even look at Natsuko the uh, new mother as it were so yeah i felt that really um i actually felt it um when i was watching it but yeah that's all i can say about the grief yeah okay. and i can't make a comparison sorry <laughs> no i don't mean me too <laughs> there's another question from dr helen mcnaughton from online um she says great panel and she says hello as well uh, she says miyazaki movies often have strong female protagonists the main character in this film is clearly male but are there any gender messages in this movie? This is one for Satana. Okay. Thank um, you, Helen. Thank you so much. <laughs> I think there's a really um, strong female um, element too, like Mother, Kiriko, and Natsuko. Um, so, and it was about, I think, about him missing his mum and... So is it gendered? I'm not sure. Um, yeah, but I think female was as a female presence was as strong as male. I think I would say that's actually stronger in a way because it's like reincarnation and also like reborn, you know, like, for example, Natsu, was it Natsu? No, Natsu, sorry. Um, Mahito's real mother's mother. Can't sorry, oh, anyway. Natsuko is the yeah. sister, right? Yeah. Sorry, not, not Natsuko, sorry. Mahito's real mom. Yeah. Uh, Can't remember her name. But anyway, uh, she, um, she knowing going back to the real world, she would die, but she had to go back to give birth to Mahito. So that sort of powerful message, mm. I, yeah, I felt quite mm. strongly. I mean, you can read the whole film as a kind of the, the whole underworld is a sort of a, is is a male idea of of empire. That's a parakeet. There is a kind of a, a, a godlike figure that creates the balance, the equilibrium that holds the world together. Mm -hmm. um, and but that needs a successor, and for that you need to abduct 
um not the nut score to 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 get a successor so there is a there's a there's a kind of strong uh gender dynamic mm. there i think and it sort of uh it ends with uh, Mahito saying, no, I'm not going to be the successor here. And the world collapses as a result, right? Mm -hmm. So I think there is there is a strong uh, point yeah, to be yeah, there. That's yeah. Uh, yeah, sort of the militaristic, uh, the parakeets especially. Mm -hmm. uh, both sort of at the beginning, you think, haha, they're quite funny. But then you realize that they really are mm -hmm. their fascist mm -hmm. parakeets. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And also, right, even, even though Mahito, of course, is a boy, but in this world, in the fantasy world, he cannot make it without mm. the women's help, he, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. First exactly. Kiriko, Kiriko. Uh, and then the, his his well, mother uh, spirit <laughs> that helps the 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 Warawa Warawara 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 Wara, 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 Wara. the Warawara, Wara, and then also but she that, that's genderless. The Warawara. Wara. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. so <laughs> <laughs> the gender that helps the genderless. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, something that also I, th I thought was very interesting in Mahito's voyage uh, uh, is that I think it is a reflection on grief, the fantasy world, but to me it also meant that you cannot really make it by yourself only, right? Yeah, it's about in a way of like, how, how do you live, right? You need friendship, you need love, whether it's for your friends, whatever. Uh, and, and his help, even if there is... Um, uh, farewell, like there is a detachment in the end, but he's may able to make his own decision to grow up also through the encounters yeah. that he makes. Right? And without the book that his mother left, he wouldn't have probably wouldn't have made that decision at the end. Yeah. yeah. Let's have another question from the room. Yes, please. When I watch this movie, I'm so curious about how, if I can think in like, like a higher level. I think uh, for him, it's really, uh, I really like the words you mentioned, like a, his own story, like seek uh, autobiography mm -hmm. of his like life with his mom under the colonial period of Japan. So, I assume he has a strong message for the younger in Japan to express his lineage or his reflections about the colonial period in Japan. And I also really um, also find really interesting. You mentioned about the dancing. So he also gave us his approach about how he reflects and for this period. It's not only about the negative side. Also, he wants to somehow um give us a message uh, to bring some kind of like positive lineage from that period, like the family relationship, how he anti those, uh, how to say, group culture, the masculine liberty. So how, how I, I'm, I was wondering, how do you feel as a historian about the house um, reflection about the period, the those colonial period? Yeah. Well, I think, um, yeah, he was too young to be actually be involved in the war um, fast hand. Mm -hmm. But like I said, he felt a little bit guilty about, um, you know, being well off. Uh, you can see the difference between him and his um, classmates, because I think he had loads of hair, but his classmates were like all bald. Mm -hmm. uh, so the way they mm -hmm. dressed as yeah. well. And... Uh, uh, his classmates had to work after work, whereas he didn't have to. Mm. He had to, he could just go home. So, um, and that sort of added to his loneliness because he couldn't make friends easily. So I, I don't know whether it's positive or negative. It's just, he's like sort of reminiscing his childhood because he actually did um, evacuate as well with his dad. Yeah. And one really funny thing about uh, his dad was that he didn't really mind selling like dodgy airplanes to the authority. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So it was like his maybe way of saying, I'm not going to just contribute to the war. I'm just going to make money. That's all it matters. Yeah. So it's really kind of practical mm. sort of side of Mahito's dad. And he's seen him... Um, he, seeing his dad like this, that must have impacted uh, Miyazaki's, you know, 
perceptions um, later on. And also, he, his dad was a little bit anti-authority, no? Because he had money, he mm -hmm. could just kind of go to the uh, his uh, school uh, with his what? What is it? That son, the um, mopeds. Was it moped? No, it's a it's a car. That the son. That the dust dust. Is that is that moped? It's like oh, it's a car. No, but it's a you know, it's like a gara gara. A gara, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but nobody had it. So, yeah. So it's like, sure, a bit of sure. Of, and you could just say, this is it. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. So, mm -hmm. so I don't know whether I answered the question, but yes. Yeah. Let's have another question from the room. Yes, please. Well, I'm just trying to stitch a lot of things that you said together. So, Sajanai, earlier you were saying that the the older uncle and much though were representative of Miyazaki himself passing the baton onto himself and then you were talking about how at the beginning there was a lot of a sense of grief mm. for me once he entered this magical fantastical world I interpreted it as as the story being dominated by fear actually mm. and it was I don't know if it was a fear of death but a fear of this creativity ending at the end of the story everything literally falls mm. apart and so we're talking about how there's no way this is going to be his last movie mm. um but it almost feels like throughout this movie he is acknowledging that despite his ideas continuing he no longer has the ability to hold his world his world together mm. and he has no one to pass it on he has this nostalgia but when he did have all these people around him to support him all this inspiration all this energy to create and bring his ideas to life so if we're talking about there not being any more movies in the future, or even if there are movies in the future, do you think that they will hold the same quality where it comes from his ego and his inspiration, where it comes from a place of fear, of rushing, of wanting to produce more before he feels that his time comes to an end? How old is he? He's like 82 or something. Mm. Yeah, okay, sorry. Go Can on. I link in another question from online, mm. which is slightly similar? Uh, so the anonymous attendee says, uh, if I remember correctly, the uncle told Mahito to pile three blocks a day to build a newly balanced world and continue that for 13 days. Do you feel that? Do you find any reasons for these specific numbers? Is there any reference? Any sort of three and 13. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so sorry. Numbers? I'm not sure about numbers. Yeah, yeah sorry. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, Jonah. Do you want to go for? I um, comment about the number. Mm. It could be a very like magical number for the witches, but also if we connect it to Dante's um, could be three, 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 three count ticket, right? Inferno for the a... door to the real world. But that was one three something too, right? Mm. Yeah, could be. And loads of things to decipher. Yeah, like I said, I have to watch five more times. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> frame by to frame to understand right? everything. Yeah. But I'm not sure about the fear. Because he is still really enthusiastic about creating new things. So you might see, so this is like semi-autobiography and mm. he packed a load of things. But maybe next one will be completely different. Who knows? Because, mm. um, yeah. But I'm not sure whether he's, he's I, I, I didn't actually feel the fear, but that's just me. It's, it's in interpretation, but I think he, he says, okay, I don't have like a successor, but I have friends. I have uh, Suzuki Toshio. I have, what is it, the other guy, um, Takahata mm -hmm. Isao? Takahata Isao, who was the co founder of the Jibri. So they still, he still has all these sort of friends to work with. So, and also like, you know, Mahito, he's okay because he's got friends. You know, Kiriko and mm -hmm. others. So I think that was a quite nice message. But I think the fear element is definitely there. And I, I was wondering, because we were thinking when we were talking about wh how to frame this, I was thinking about uh, On Late Style by Edward Said, which is mm -hmm. all about trying to think about whether there is such a thing as late style. So late in life, what do you do when you actually are facing death? What? How does that change your art? And, and Said writes about Beethoven and Tolstoy and so on and so forth. But I thought there was an aspect to that, that the sense that the contradictions are there, they're so strong, they're not, there's no attempt anymore to 
sort of transcend them to create like if you look at like uh, uh you know Nauschka of the valley of winds it's a fully realized world it's it's everything fits together it's a it's a wonderful story it's mm -hmm. quite a harmonious whole mm -hmm. while here in the boy and the heron there is there there are jarring forces that go against each think. other there is there is there is a sense of yes an urgency i think and that yes an urgency that perhaps uh, mm -hmm. fear brings right or, or maybe he's sort of um aware of his own sort of mortality yeah, and yes. also like yeah definitely like how long am I gonna be around but yeah how are we yeah. gonna deal with this yeah yeah I mean I think on that point then I would add uh, a third player again away <laughs> sorry because uh, I mean he he did write in late style again in response to his very good friend Said but I feel that what you what you both said about Miyazaki here being aware of his own mortality not in a way in which he like made a testament, mm -hmm. but like understanding that for for him, but also for Saeed and also for Oe, to to approach that it meant to somehow not trying to streamline and rationalize all of their aspects, but to understand that to be immortal, to be a, a, a man, a human being, means to to have all of these contradictions, acknowledge them, and make them coexist. So I think in this way, we can see the boy and the heron also as a reflection on creativity. So the, the, the fantasy world is lethal. It is a refuge, is a refuge from the fear of grief, the fear of confronting, you know, a stepmother that you don't like, the fear of uh, under feeling what you really feel inside. Like even when there is a moment where the Natsuko, so cool. yeah, exactly. So bad intentions. Bad intentions. Even she says, "Like I don't like you," you know, in this, and that's fine. But we work through those. And in the movies, um, fantasy world, the, the, that I felt as a creativity, as as representing also creativity, because it can be both a respite, but it's also something that can kill you. <laughs> It's something that is dangerous where we don't understand everything. We just have to understand that these differ different natures coexist. And this is also something that you can see in, in Oe's later works because he was more and more concerned with his own mortality. But in these works that reflect also on Japanese history, for example, in Death by Water from 2009, he was writing that while he was being trialed for defamation when he wrote his Okinawa Noto about this mass suicide that was, we, we don't really know what happened, but during the war in Okinawa, an entire village almost was committed mass suicide by drowning. And we don't really have any documents that say that a certain officer made that order some some versions say that it was because the the US army was coming so better die on our own term so we don't know what really happened but Oe did take a stand in his Okinawa Noto in the 70s and he said that to give this order to people to commit mass suicide it was inhuman so he was um he was trial he was he was called called to trial for for slander for defamation and at that time, he also wrote Death by Water, which does not mention Okinawa, but is also something that acknowledges in a way that, you know, we all have our own histories and, and to, be, to be somehow alive, to be modern, to be a man means to, to somehow understand that there are difficult, difficult and diverse, like contrasting aspects in yourself. And I think that in in a way, this this sentiment seems to be pervading intellectuals such as Miyazaki, Edward Said, and and a few others. There's a question from uh, Olivia online who says, "Thank you so much for a fascinating discussion. What struck me was how I felt I had to work through the narrative of this film, and the world that Miyazaki created felt more fluid and loose. I felt this might reflect or encourage the audience to explore the very process of dealing with grief." but do you have any reflections on why this movie felt more open than other films? I think it's more open to interpretation in that sense, yeah, in that late style sense. Yeah. You, do, you don't feel the necessity to prefab all the meanings that you want the audience to take from it. It's a much more sort of saying here, 
this is me as the artist this is what I do I don't necessarily understand it myself and and Miyazaki in many interviews has said similar things like you know I start from here there's the image there's the movement and then let's see where we go from here so there is an openness to the process but this is really much stronger I think in this last film yes. um where it is essentially it's it's an offer to the audience saying here you do the work of figuring out um um what it means at least that's that's what I felt I also mm. felt yes it is quite hard work it's mm -hmm. not it's something you yeah. see you know and all the narrative the narrative is clearly presented oh this means that oh yes it is the mother oh okay wonderful yeah it and, is like a puzzle yes yeah so you have to work it out as you watch it maybe once twice mm. three times so you might get yeah, new discoveries but I but I I agree it is more open yeah Shall I? Mm -hmm. yeah a mouse over here, quite strange. Ah, yeah. uh, Why? The teeth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I cannot understand it. Yeah. What do you think? <laughs> it's a caricature of maybe the producer. Mm. I haven't seen the, I haven't seen the producer's pictures. Of oh, Suzuki but... Itoshi. Yes, yeah, Suzuki uh -huh. Itoshi. <laughs> I don't think. Yeah, yeah, like maybe, <laughs> maybe not. But like a caricature <laughs> yes. version. Uh -huh. Um. So because he 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 mm. really likes the producer like a friend old friend mm. Mm. so it's like a affection the teeth are also there in you see them when they smile mm. but you also see them when oh. it's a more threatening oh, yeah. question so there's a there's sort of ambiguity about the this image of the tooth mm. uh, i think yeah yeah it, it's not as if like you know things are more complicated than we yeah. think like very to put it super bluntly mm which I think does relate to what we were saying earlier on, right? That you don't have to understand everything. Like at some point you see, you make your own meaning and then you move on. Right? Yeah. It's up to way. you to yeah. sort of interpret mm. uh, as well. Mm. Yeah. Should we have another? Yes, please. Um, uh, I went to see it with my wife and uh, she's um, Japanese and uh, she's born about a year after Miyazaki and she was... Um, uh, taken out of Tokyo for doing the Academy Award for a conference in Rosie. And I couldn't quite make it out. And I asked her, what did it mean? And she said, oh, it's very straightforward. It's telling us how to behave after the war. Oh. And um, uh, and I suppose thinking about it, uh, actually, I, got, I began to get that. So I think a lot of the, um, it's obviously framed in the war. Uh, and I think some, I think it's historical, um, and, and in fact, I've heard Japanese say this, and it was quite a bit of you know, town kids who went out into the internet. Um, and, you know, the parakeets, it seemed to me parakeets and their leader, and this was the army and the mm -hmm. emperor, you know, very obviously. And uh, I think it's very much focused on the, on the Second World War. And sometimes what we as old people do is actually not worry about mortality. We start thinking about our very young age. So to that, to me, was, was how it was going. And I, I think it was sort of, to me, it was creating the confusion of war and then what, what exactly should we do as a result? What, what, what comes next? How do, how do we... Hmm. So I thought, I thought her analysis was actually not good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions in the room? Sorry, yeah. if I may something. Yeah, go on. So, but he decided to actually destroy this world of fascism mm. by not inheriting this role as the uh what is it the emperor was it the emperor yeah, the... Sure that that, that will yeah but then he decided to make it collapse because by not inheriting it the world collapsed right because he could have succeeded it and he could have let the world go on but he decided not to so I thought that was like saying, I'm not going to contribute to that. Hmm. It's the equilibrium that we see mm -hmm. in the in the final moment of the film. So if the, the, the main parakeet is the emperor, there's still this godlike figure of the uncle that sort of is even more mysterious than that. And the equilibrium then doesn't hold, the world collapses and everybody is relieved. So... Well, maybe that's where then you have to ask the question. So, what? Where do we go from there? Mm. I mean, that's. I think that's that's a that's yeah. a good 
interpretation, right? So, okay, so now everything has collapsed, but that's the end of the film, right? Mm. So it doesn't, it sort of ends on a slightly upbeat note, perhaps. Yeah, yeah because then he decided to, okay, I'm not going to be part of this. Mm. Um, it's going to be, maybe the real world is mm. going to be really messy because war was still going on. Yeah. But I, I choose to live in this messy world mm. rather than in this mm. kind of fantasy world mm. where he could be the god. Mm. So, yeah. And of course, he is a young, he's a child and he makes takes the decision to live in a world where his mother doesn't exist. Right? Yeah, exactly. Where, where she has died, right? right. So th that is a very important step to take, mm. right? Mm. Yes, please. That's interesting. Yeah. I think it's a creativity, right? Yeah. So this is a builder of universes. You have the power to do that. It's very tricky. You need to find the right equilibrium to do so. Mm. But he takes the stone. I thought that as well, right? And the stone comes with him in the other world. And he then literally, if you think of uh, Miyazaki himself, he then creates his own universes out of that. I think it's actually a very yeah. nice. Yeah, yeah. And the stone, there's lots of stones. Like if you think about the 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 uh, Hikoseki, uh, the the flying stone in um, in a Castle in the Sky, there's lots of you know magical stones that mm. embody a particular kind of power. Mm. And also, I know I thought about not forgetting, right? Mm. So you, you you don't inherit the world. You you make a choice, but it's to, like a legacy. Yeah, yeah, but at the same time, you sh we should not completely forget what we chose not to have because you know it can be memory of not making the same mistakes but also the creativity Reminder. because for i i'm I, I would think that for for somebody such as miyazaki even art and creativity they're not some they are also passed on mm. this is why you have references to other right. authors right it, you make your own but it is passed on so I, I, yeah i thought it was a symbol of legacy as well mm. Didn't Heron say something like, you're going to forget about this soon? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But he took that mm. when he left mm. the house. Mm. So that was quite symbolic as well. Yes, 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 yeah. exactly. I think we've got time for maybe one or two more questions. Are there any in the room? Got one online. Um, it's a question from Mina that says, you mentioned that the other world was an afterlife, but it struck me as more of a simulife. life since it sat outside of time and ran ran alongside ours. Do you have any ideas or thoughts about how the movie plays with time or timelessness? Thank you for the talk. I think it's under, underworld and upperworld. Mm. I, I maybe not say afterworld, but it's the time is a little bit different because you, if you remember, Mahito's mother disappeared when she was young, right? So that was when Mahito was in the underworld too. So the time is, um, yeah, it, it, it's, I don't know, it's like a parallel or it is, yeah, it's warped. Yeah, it's, I don't think it's clear, but it, it is, um, when was Mahito's mother disappeared when she was like Mahito's age? Something like that? She was know. younger. She was young, yeah. so for a year. Mm. But then Mahito was there when she was there, so... That must have been what 50 years, 40 years difference. Yeah. So that, yeah, it's a sort of different universe, maybe, mm -hmm. I would say. Different yeah. universe. The multiverse. It's Miyazaki's that's it. multiverse. Yeah, that's it. yeah multiverse. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. I mean, it's a parallel universe in the sense that it, it mirrors what happens yeah. in the real world. But the time, if you look at the the lived experience of the film time, is that the, the, the first part of the film is quite slow. Um, there's mm. lots of walking and unpacking and doing very mundane things. And then once we enter the other world, there's something happens. There's, there's, there's time is speed up and things happen very quickly. Quick, quick, quick. Um, so, so there is a sense that, that these two universes, they, they move at a different mm. um, yeah. speed. It's a bit like a Marvel movie. Mm. I, I, 
Yeah. Doctor Strange. Presumably. Or... <laughs> no. I don't know. <laughs> All right, I think that's about all we have time for. So uh, please join me in giving a round of applause for our one. Thank panel. you. Thank you all very much for coming tonight. And uh, please keep an eye on the SOAS Japan Research Web Center website and the SOAS Library website for future events. And we hope to see you again soon. Have a good evening. <laughs>